Hallelujah. Here I sit with my phone. Glory to God. Would you? We we live too serious. We're way too serious about life. We're way too serious about what's going on around us. We live too serious. And we're too serious about things we don't aren't to be serious about. Or too careful about things that we're not supposed to be careful about. Oh. The season that we're in with regards to politics, uh, you can become way too careful about it, full of care about it. I mean, if, if you if you enjoy following it, that's okay. That's it. That's you know. I'm not saying good or bad, but if you find it that it's causing you anxiety and anxiousness and concern and care and all that, uh, it's went it's went too far. It's went too far because Jesus gave us things to enjoy. He said, "I've given you all things to enjoy." So if you don't enjoy watching Fox News and seeing all the political junk on there, if you're not enjoying it, then maybe God didn't give it to you. If you're too worried or concerned about your body, uh, he did give you your body, but if you're too concerned about it, you're looking at it the wrong way. Uh, if you're looking at your, your resources, your bank account, and uh, how much you're making or how much you're not making, um, and it's bringing you care and concern, um, then you're looking at it the wrong way. That's some good preaching right there. Come on, Jeff. See, and that's the whole reason uh, for some of the things that I've been sharing the last couple of weeks is when you're in his presence, you get a clear picture or a clear view of what it's to look like. And when you get a clear view and a picture of what it's to look like, uh, you don't have any care with it. You don't get anxious about it. But if you're anxious about it, that means you're uh, looking at the wrong thing. When I see people care, and, and this I include myself because I don't, I'm not trying to say that there's not anxiety that doesn't try to come on me. Um, but what I've learned is when ang anxiousness comes on me or care comes on me or worry comes on me or uh, just being too serious gets all over me and... Uh, it's, I owe, I've gotten really good at recognizing that I'm looking at the wrong thing. Because if you're looking at him, the one that took all our cares, that took all our concerns, that took all our worries, um, and we're looking at him and realize that he took all that upon himself, uh, then I realize, well, then I got nothing to be careful about. I got nothing to be anxious for. See, all the things that, that Jesus did, uh, all the things that he went through, uh, let me say it that way, all the things that he went through uh, in his crucifixion leading up to his death and then his resurrection, all those things that he did and all the things that we read about are so that we wouldn't have to think about them anymore. He took them. He took those all the things that we could have a tendency to care about, he took. And he took them so we wouldn't have to care about them anymore. But the fact that we do care about them is many times an indicator, not always, but many times an indicator is we don't necessarily believe or trust that he took it. So we think we have to grab a hold of it. And we don't have to grab a hold of it because he really did take it. He took everything. Everything that... Life without God could throw at humanity, meaning after Adam and Eve fell and, and God basically told them, in a short version, 
but you can encompass it into the way humanity lives separated from God, is you're going to have to do life on your own. How many know if you just take that statement and think about it, that's worrisome? As a believer, if you've tasted and seen anything good of God, to think that, wow, I'm going to have to do life alone. I don't know about you. I don't want to do life alone. Uh, I want to do it with him. And I actually want to do it with him to the degree where I don't want to do anything unless he says do it. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Lord. But, but Jesus did everything that he did, went through everything that he went through so that it actually truly is finished. It really is finished. How many can say amen, amen to that? When Jesus said it's finished, that means all of the challenges and difficulties of life in the sense of how we respond to them is finished. There's still a devil, we know that. Um, and, and he still creates havoc in those that don't know God. Unfortunately, he still creates a lot of havoc in those that do know God. But in their limited knowing of him, and when I say knowing, meaning experiencing him, for themselves and realizing that he really does have and took care of all the issues. Let me know that when, when you're dealing with something and you get a revelation that God took care of that, and all of a sudden the anxiety or the care leaves, I, I believe that everybody in this room has experienced that at one time or another. Um, it changes everything. And then that revelation that we get from that ought to then begin to be expressed or experienced continually. I don't know where that came from. I don't care. <laughs> but, but revelation uh, of the goodness of our God, the goodness of our Father, when we get revelation... Those revelations are not one-time revelations. They're, they're, those revelations are, and, and when we get brought out of a situation or something is revealed to us to walk closer with him, to walk in the freedom that he's already provided, is now that when similar situations arise in our life, um, we have a... Uh, uh, a treasure chest of things to tap into so we don't struggle with the anxieties and difficulties of life. So I would, in other words, I would say this, is whatever, whatever God has brought us through in times past by the revelation that he's given us, we should have continued experiences and revelations in that arena. But if we all we do is ever reflect on something that's happened a long time ago and that's the only thing that we have, it's just like, well, God did this. Praise the Lord for that. But how many more times has he used the revelation to get you out of it here and out of it here and out of it here and out of it here? We ought to have multiple testimonies. That's, that's another words what I'm saying. We ought to have multiple testimonies of the revelation. Revelation is not just for a one-time thing. It's not just for a one-time thing. We get excited, and that, is a, that can be a monumental thing in our lives, in a sense, is we know the time, but then we ought to have multiple testimonies that that one revelation has helped us in through our walk. Amen. Amen. But those come by, by spending time with him in his presence. The cares of life get lifted off when you're in his presence. Uh, hand me my Bible. I've gotten used to this sitting down here. I kind of like it. Your mic doesn't like it. No, my mic doesn't like this. That's what it doesn't like. I like this. See? I told the mic that it needed to get in line with what I like. I almost sometimes think she doesn't like this. 
na 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 Turn with me over to, turn with me over to a familiar passage of scripture in the book of Hebrews. I think I shared this a couple of weeks ago, but we're going to look at it again. Hebrews chapter four. We'll see how the New Living says it. Hebrews chapter 4, I guess we'll just, well, let's back, let's back up to verse 12. It says, for the word of God is full of living power. How many believe the word of God is full of living power? Yes. It is sharper than the sharpest knife, cutting deep into our innermost thoughts and desires. It exposes us for what we really are. Nothing in all creation can hide from him. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, you can't hide anything. Right. You may, you may hide, we may hide it, we may hide it from one another. And in many cases, you, we're not even good at hiding it from one another. Yeah. I mean, I, I know when she's troubled, meaning my wife, she knows when I'm troubled and, and we can really put good faces on. But but when you've, and, and I say this because this is about the relationship of knowing, um, you, can, you can really put a good face on, but you know when stuff's not right. You just know it. But the one thing that I've learned in those situations is uh, many times when it comes to our personal relationship is she don't know it at the time. So I've learned to not say, well, something's going on. It's just like, I'll just simply ask her, you know, what's going on? And if she says nothing or I don't know, I just leave it alone because I've learned that at that time, she doesn't know. So then I turn it over to God and say, God, uh, there's something going on with your daughter, my wife. Uh, you know that, and I see that. She's not seeing that. She'll show her. Yeah. And I know she does the same with me. Yeah. And usually, you know, a day or two after that, she'll come to me and say, you know, you asked me the other day what was going on. Well, this is what's going on. Now, sometimes I don't like what she tells me because what's going on is partly my doing. <laughs> but that's okay because you can't grow unless you're willing to be confronted and uh, have truth brought to you. Amen. I'd rather have someone bring me the truth and hurt my feelings a little bit than to hide and skirt around it and leave me where I'm at. Yeah. Leaving me where I'm at serves no purpose, does no good, doesn't benefit me or you. Amen. Where was I? 412. All right. He exposes this for, yeah, verse 13, nothing in all creation can hide from him. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. This is the God to whom we must explain all that we've done. Ooh, that's a whole message in itself. I'm not going to camp there this morning. But that's a good one to think about. There is a day where we're going to give explanation to things. And when I say, and when it says there, uh, explanation to all the things that we've done, it doesn't mean all the things that you've done wrong, all the sin. Why did you do this? Because uh, we have to, in the full counsel of God's word, if it says that He's forgiven us of our sins as far as the east is from the west, and He chooses to remember them no more, He's not then all of a sudden on the day that we go to be with Him, say, you know, I did that for your benefit until today. Now I'm going to dig the book out and we're going to go through all these. No, that's not what he's talking about. The account is for what we've done in this body with regards to the plan, to the purpose, what we did, what we did with the gifts and the talents to, to 
move forward with the plan of God. Our part. What did we do with that? That's what he's talking about. Yeah. To put anybody's mind at ease. For the longest time, I, I misinterpreted that scripture and it, it kind of put an element of, Ooh, I just can't do, I got to get everything right. It's like, no, no, no. Either it's under the blood or it's not. <laughs> Either it's under the blood or it's not. Glory to God. And if anybody tries to come to you and bring, throw stuff back up in your face uh, and, and say, thus saith the Lord, that's a lie from the pit of hell because God, God doesn't throw it up in your face and he's not going to use somebody else to throw it up in your face. If he doesn't remember it, why would he tell somebody else about it so they can remind you of it? So if anybody tries to throw something back in your face, just say, well, that ain't God. So get thee behind me, Satan. That'll shut them up real quick. Verse 14 says, that is why we have a great high priest. Aren't you glad we have a great high priest? Who has gone to heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us cling to him. Oh, my goodness. Let us cling to him and never stop trusting him. Cling to him. What a picture. Cling to him. You ever have something cling to you? And no matter how hard you try to get it off, it just don't get off. Well, we're supposed to cling to him. Now, we know that Jesus was never like, oh, my gosh, can I? But that's how we're to cling to him. Never, in other words, never lose our grip. I mean, you got such a grip on him, it wouldn't make any difference if, if a hurricane came through or a torn, F5 tornado came through or no matter what, and the wind would be blowing like, it's just like, mm-mm. The enemy should never be able to let you to release your grip. But we do sometimes. And, and, and it's saying, we have a great high priest. It tells us we have a great high priest. So don't, don't lose your grip on him for anything. Yeah. See, and what, what, happens, what happens is, is if uh, when, we're, when we're not clinging to him or we're, we lose our grip or... Um, we take our eyes off of uh, all, all these things are, are a, a, a picture of we're beginning to it's seemingly we're beginning to let go what happens is when we do that is we slip over into our own strength of trying to instead of and, and our, own, our strength should be for one reason and one reason only to cling to him and to hang on to him. And it's, if it seems as if we're slipping and letting go, the strength that we have should just still be back to, I'm not letting go of him. But many times when we begin to let go, what strength we do have, what little strength or what strength we think we have, is we begin to apply it to uh, trying to help ourselves. That's why we're to cling to him. Clinging gives us a picture of is you never let go of him and even if it feels like you are, you grab on harder. <laughs> you grab on harder. This is all about him. He's the only one. You can't get you out of your, yourself out of your own mess. You can't. But we try many times. There's a lot more I could say on that, but we're not going to go that, that direction today. You hear me talk about that enough. Uh, not that you'll, I'll stop talking about it, but. It says, that's why we have a great high priest, verse 14, who has gone to heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us cling to him and never stop trusting him. Never stop. Everyone say, I'll never stop, I'll never stop. Trusting, him. trusting him. Verse 15 says, this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. How many know that God understands your weaknesses? He understands. I mean, he made you. He knows you better than you know you. I don't know why we think sometimes that we, 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 we buy into the fact that God just doesn't know. God just doesn't understand what I'm going through. How many have ever felt that way? Have been in a place where it's just like, God, you, you just don't know how bad it is. And he's like, really? Really? 
I don't know how bad it is. But in our, in our despair, many times where we, this is danger, this is the danger in our despair is we don't necessarily grab onto or gravitate to the fact as he doesn't understand, but we want somebody to understand. That's why we go and talk about it, because we want somebody to understand. When we already have somebody who understands, yeah, Jesus, why he's not sufficient for us sometimes, that he understands, I don't know, I'm, I'm just as guilty. Uh, you know, when I say that, I'm really, none of us are guilty because we're, we've been pardoned. But you know what I mean when I make a statement like that. Some people run off with them little statements, so it's, and, and it's just like, oh my gosh, I'm guilty? It's like, no, no, you're really not. But that's, that's where sometimes we, we miss it is it's not good enough to know that he understands. We want somebody to hear us. We want to be heard, and we want somebody to understand what we're going through or what we've gone through. And, and I said this just as of recent, um, I'm never going to understand what you're going through or what you've gone through because I'm not going through it. I may have gone through something similar, but I still don't understand because all of us are created uniquely. And all of us have the potential to deal with things differently. But that doesn't change the fact is our uniqueness our personalities are not to dictate how we want to be heard or how we deal with things. God's, God's given us a very clear plan and a very clear purpose of how. So I, I like the fact that, it's, that the high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same temptations. He's faced all of the same temptations. I'll say that again. He has faced all of the same temptations. He's faced them. So I personally am becoming much better at, and have gotten much better at, is I, I, don't, I don't need to try and get someone to understand. Uh, because even if they do understand, they can't do anything about it. <laughs> Because Jesus did something about it. Right. Nothing more can be done about it. And sometimes we can uh, convince ourselves that sympathy and a pat on the back is going to make it all better. It really isn't. It really isn't. What makes it better is when you have the revelation that Jesus uh, was tempted the same way you were and he overcame it. And, has the vict and got the victory in it. And now that victory that he got is your victory. Yes, you. Yes. And you receive that by faith. Yes. You go, yeah. you know what? I don't have to worry about getting the victory because Jesus already yes. got the victory. Yes. And I'm going to take his victory for my own. Yes. Amen. I'm going to take his victory for my own. And now I don't have to fight. Now I don't have to fight. Now I don't have to try. Now I don't have to put forth all this effort. All I have to do is believe that he was tempted the same way and he overcame the temptation and his overcoming of the temptation is enough for me because that's now on my account. So the reality is I've overcome it. I'm not trying to overcome it. I'm not in the process of overcoming it. I have overcome it. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I have. Yes. Why? Because Jesus did. Yes. If Jesus was still trying to overcome it, then we could say, well, I'm trying to overcome it too. But Jesus already overcame it. Every temptation, every weakness in the flesh, because that's what it says. When it says there, it says... 
The high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same temptations. Jesus had the opportunity because he had flesh just like ours. He didn't have supernatural flesh. He did not have supernatural flesh. He did not have flesh that didn't have the ability to get sick. He did, because he had flesh just like ours. He didn't have, uh, how do I want to say it? Because he had flesh and a soul, emotions, um, he was faced with uh, financial uh, choices. When, when he was faced with having to pay taxes, he didn't get nervous about paying taxes. We shouldn't get nervous about paying taxes. What's it making a difference? we got to pay taxes, so what? Yeah, come on. God took care of the tax issue, yeah. did he not, yeah. for Jesus? Yeah. We don't know how big the tax issue was. Mm -hmm. But I'll bet you in that, in that day that the penalty for not paying taxes was probably harsher than the penalty is today. Probably very well could have meant death. Been. Or you become a slave to pay off your debt. You know, there's a, but, but he was faced with that. So he, he was faced with financial difficulties, just like we're faced with financial difficulties. He was faced with physical difficulties, but the physical difficulties didn't get on him or uh, he didn't give place to the physical difficulties. Why? Because he knew his father. He knew who his father was. And the knowing who his father was also goes along with that he knew that he wasn't, Jesus knew that he wasn't his body and his soul. He knew that he was a spirit that came from heaven, clothed himself, or not clothed him, but came in and was clothed just like we're clothed with a body. And he knew that his father was spirit. So the spirit connection is what allowed him to overcome every weakness that was contrary to the spirit. Yeah. Because the things in the spirit are greater and stronger than anything that, any temptation that the enemy can throw at us. Absolutely. That's how Jesus overcame it. Thank you. Jesus didn't depend on anything in the world to overcome the temptations. He depended on his connection with the Father yeah. and his connection with the Father only. Yeah. That's right. That's good. And some would say, well, what do you mean? When he paid his taxes, he needed money. He did, but it's how he got the money. That's right. It's how he got it. Yet this system is set up on a monetary system. So, you, you know, don't, don't pay your taxes and you'll find out uh, that you need money. Yeah. Go into a store. Go into the grocery store or go into the restaurant this afternoon after church and order up your favorite meal, and then tell the waitress, uh, I don't need any money, and just get up and walk out. See how far you get. <laughs> yeah. she don't pay. It's how he got the money. Yeah. It's how he got the money. It's the same way of how he fed the 5,000. He needed enough food. But how he got the food is he didn't do what we would normally do. We, we're, we're too carnally minded, and carnally minded in this sense is not some nasty thing, carnally minded. It's we're too carnally minded, meaning we still have a tendency to think too much like the world, and it's because, because we're not spiritually minded. Remember, the Bible says, there's one place in the Bible, I don't know, offhand, I don't know where it is, but the Bible says that we have the mind of Christ, and it says, let this mind be in you. We have to let it. We have to give ourselves permission to begin to think spiritually. Because yes. if we don't think spiritually, we'll automatically pick up or gravitate to the way we've always thought and the way we've always done things. So we have to, it says, let this mind be in you. We have to make a conscious choice to let the mind of Christ begin to, but you'll never be able to let the mind of Christ uh, be in you or begin to, uh, begin to use the mind of Christ to make righteous choices and righteous decisions 
if, if we're not willing to let go of our old way of thinking and, and many times to comfort ourselves and pacify ourselves and even, uh, well, I won't say that. To comfort ourselves or to pacify ourselves is we'll many times say, well, this is what God told me to do. When in fact, God didn't have any part in it. And we really need to be honest with ourselves with that, that we really need to ask ourselves the questions and really dig deep into, did God really tell you that? Or is, is that what you did? And, and to make yourself, if I could say pacify or make yourself feel better, is bring God into the equation because then it's just like, ha, huh, see, I trusted God. This is like, but you didn't trust God. Because many times the decisions and the choices that we make are the same decisions and choices we made before we ever knew God. Why we get born again and we bring God into the equation, I don't know if it eases our conscience, makes us feel better. Uh, I don't know, but, but, the, but, but Jesus, his spiritual connection, see the whole, the whole emphasis of the message that I've been sharing the last couple of weeks is the spiritual connection. Jesus said, uh, with the woman at the well, those that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. Uh, the Bible tells us that God is spirit. You can't come to God in the flesh. You have to come to him in spirit. You can't talk to God in the flesh. You, come, you talk to him in the spirit. Um, it, it, and you can't hear God in the flesh. You hear him in the spirit. Come on. Uh, if, if you ever are challenged with the thought is, well, I'm just not hearing God, it's you haven't switched over your hearing to your spiritual ears. You're still trying to hear him with your natural ears. Your natural ears will never hear what God has to say. It won't. And so th this, I believe this will help all of us that if we think that we're not hearing from God, uh, Switch your hearing. Or in other words, you could say we probably all heard something similar to this. Switch the frequency. We have a, a natural frequency and we have a spiritual frequency. And uh, we want to stay on the spiritual or on the natural frequency and get answers. You'll never get your answers in the natural frequency. That's the wrong frequency. Uh, you, you, won't, you won't pick up. Yeah, actually, I like what you just said, Roger. That's very important because that's the frequency that the enemy broadcasts on. That's the frequency, the natural frequency. That's the frequency. That's the only access he has into our life. He doesn't have access in the spiritual arena. Remember, remember I, I make mention of many times what Brother Hagin said. If the enemy can keep you in the realm of reason, he'll whoop you every time. That's the natural frequency, the realm of reason. That's the things that we know to be true because of our experiences before Christ. When in fact, they're really not true. We think they're true. We will even declare them. We know them to be true when in fact, that's not. Or I would liken it and say it this way. You've heard me say this before. That's the realm of facts. Facts are not true because facts are subject to change. All facts are subject to change. Because facts are created in this arena, in the natural arena. Every fact is subject to change. Every fact is. Truth is not subject to change. It's not subject to change. So Jesus' spiritual connection, see, these are some basic things, um, but yet not basic many times. Uh, but the scripture, we all know the scripture. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, where it says, you know, I wish above all things that your spirit, soul, and body. I think I just connected that with 3 John 2, but whatever. <laughs> it works together. <laughs> because it really, in 3 John 2, it is talking about spirit, soul, and body. Um, but, but it tells us about the three parts. And, and we can be so sometimes, and I say this this way because I've, I've trained myself to not be overly confident in what I think I know. Because about the moment you think or become overly confident in what you think you know is when the enemy pulls a quick one on you. Yeah. 
And in other words, what I'm saying is keeping a level of humility always, no matter how much you know, no matter how deep or great of revelation you've received, is keeping a level of humility that there's more that I don't know, yeah. even in that arena. Yeah. And so I've, I've learned in my connection with the Father is that when I come to Him uh, and spend time with Him, that I come to Him uh, with an attitude of, I don't know. Even though I know some things, just like you all know some things. But I come with a, an attitude of humility of, I don't know anything. I need you to show me. I need you to talk to me. And, and that's when I've had the greatest results of going deeper and walking the life of Christ. Because ultimately, Jesus died, first and foremost, is to restore relationship. But then when that, once that relationship is restored, then we're to walk like Jesus walked. Amen. The relationship, and I know we've all heard these statements before, but it's not just fire insurance. The restored relationship was not just so we could go to heaven or that when we lay these bodies down that we know we're not going to spend life in hell, that we're going to spend life with God. The restored relationship was to start the life of Christ in us was to start immediate. The day that we got born again, the life of Christ began in us. <laughs> the life of Christ, the hope of glory, meaning the hope that his glory would live through us and shine from us and affect us and change us and all the things that the glory is capable of doing happened or has the potential to happen the day we get born again. I'm not waiting for the glory to do something. The glory's already done it. I know I said a lot there because I haven't even gotten to what I was, why I wanted you to open up to Hebrews. Huh. Verse 16. This is what I wanted to get to. Verse 16. This, is, this, is, this kind of can sum up much of even the message the last couple of weeks. Uh, why it's important to develop the personal, intimate relationship with him that goes beyond just the reading and confessing of Scripture. Um, I'm not diminishing reading and confession of Scripture. I'll, I'll keep saying that as I preach messages like this because some people will go off the, with, with the harebrained idea that, well, Pastor Sayer said that we don't have to read the Bible anymore. I'm not saying that. That I, and I'm not devaluing the importance of the Bible because some will go off and go, well, Pastor Steve just doesn't value the word like I value the word. No, I value the word because the word is what's led me to the Father. Without the word, I don't know if I'd have found him. I think I would have because there was a period of time where the Bible wasn't in print and people found God. And people are still finding God without Bibles. They, they, there's, there's still civilizations that are being found that have had experiences with God and never had a Bible, never even had a preacher. God showed up to them. I believe, and, I, and I, this is something that I believe 100%, uh, is even the indigenous people of this nation, um, and I've not, this, I only know this through testimony that I've heard from others, uh, I can't say that I've ever got sat down and talked very closely with them to hear these things, but I believe it to be true because of the testimonies that I've heard is when they explain experiences of the spirit world and encounters that they've had with the spirit world, um, it's very clear to see that, and now I, I'm not saying that they haven't had some encounters that weren't of God, but it's very clear to me that they've had and did have years ago encounters with God, encounters with the Son of God, 
encounters with the Holy Ghost. Um, I believe that many religions today, uh, that we would, you know, just like, ah, and I'm not saying go practice anything that they do, but I believe the reason why some of the things that they've, they've learned and some of the things that they say is because they've had limited encounters of the spirit world the, or the spirit realm. But how many know that the enemy will come along and accommodate you to get you into a ditch on something? Come on. Amen. Every time. I'm okay. So verse 16, this is where I wanted to get to. I said that all what I just said again to simply say that I'm summing up um, what, what I've been talking about having that personal relationship that, that goes beyond just the reading of the word and confession of scriptures. Is, it says, so let us come. Right there. So let us come. It doesn't say, so let us pick up our Bible and read even though that's important. It says, let us come. Which indicates to me that after you've read your Bible, after you've meditated on Scripture, is come. Come to the one who wrote it. Go to the one who wrote it and ask him to expound on it. Ask him to show you the intricacies of why he wrote it and the value of it and uh, how to extract the truth out of it. Because, oh, did I go out now or am I still on? Okay. Um, because even the natural, even the natural, um, we eat food, but there's a reason for eating food to extract from it the benefits of it. It's not just about filling up our belly. It's about extracting the benefits of it. See, when you go to God, that's what you're doing, is you're extracting, you're asking him or you're, he's showing you um, the benefits and shows you how to extract the truth out of it so that you grow thereby. The Bible talks about growing. Amen? Amen? But it says, so let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Now, I don't want to focus on the boldly, even though that's an important thing. We need to boldly come. There's never a time that we don't come boldly to him. We shouldn't come feeling beat down we should be so confident because it's, what it's indicating here is our confidence in our Father and how much He loves us. I mean, we can come to Him with any question, with any difficulty, with any challenge, whatever we're facing. We come boldly to Him. He's, he's not one that's, gonna, that, that's sitting there, you know, like Sister Mary Elephant. <laughs> if those of you remember with Sister Mary Elephant in a, in a thing that used to be done on the Cheech and Chong album. <laughs> I'm dating myself. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I was to stop getting the Dear Lord, I don't know what's more distracting, the thing scratching or the faces I'm getting. <laughs> I'm sorry, honey. Um, but to come boldly means that you can come to him no matter what condition you seem to think you're in, um, no matter what you think you may have done, you can come to him boldly because you're not going to have, and I use that phrase, Sister Mary Elva, you're not going to get your knuckles whacked with the ruler because you've done wrong or you don't have it, have it together. No, what it's saying there, coming boldly, not in a proud sense, you're coming boldly because you know you're loved. And you can go to him in whatever condition you may think you're in, because remember, it's a condition that you think you're in. He sees you one way. That's why you can come to him, uh, because you're accepted no matter what. And his, his ears are open to you no matter what. 
And he's not withholding from you because you didn't cross all your T's and dot all your I's. Um, you can come boldly. And, and we come to him. This is why we come to him. We come to him because it's there we'll receive mercy. So as you come to him boldly to the throne of our gracious God, there, it's there. When you come to him, it's there. It's there. Everyone say, it's there. Yeah. It's there where we'll receive mercy and we'll find grace. Well, grace is God's ability. How many want to find God's grace? Where do you find that? In his presence. This is his word that leads us to his presence to find grace. <laughs> I need to go to his presence. How many in here need to go into his presence because you have need of grace? How many have need of grace 24-7? You need grace. You needed grace to get up this morning. You may not think you did, but you did. You didn't do it on your own. <laughs> but that's, that's my, my point is, and why I'm emphasizing so much that we need to go beyond what we've maybe thought or considered is uh, it's in his presence is where things are unfolded. The Logos is just the beginning. The Logos points us in directions and in areas of him that we need to go to to then to receive that grace or that ability, wonder-working ability. Come on. And really, I would like to back that up just one moment. We have everything that we have need of, but we don't necessarily know how to use it. So that would be more his grace, his ability is we've been given everything when we got born again, and especially if we've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. But we don't necessarily know how to use it. So you go to him to understand how to use it. And there's nobody better than the manufacturer <laughs> that knows how to use it. Amen. If he made it, he knows how to use it. He knows how to get the most out of it. Amen. And I can assure you with God, because we serve a God that is very precise, that is very absolute, that is very accurate, he doesn't have shortcuts. He's made it to be used a certain way. And if we think we can cut corners we're badly mistaken. And the reality is, is we need to really go, why would I want to cut corners? Because the way he's done it, the way he does it, the way he demonstrated it through his son Jesus, and then through Peter and Paul and Philip and Stephen and John, and James, and all the writers, and all the ones, and even in the Old Testament, the way he demonstrated the types and shadows of Christ to come, and what his body was going to look like, um, why, why do you want to cut corners? Because when really, when you read the stories, they're phenomenal. Why would you want to cut any of that out? <laughs> I don't know about you, but, and, and sometimes for myself, that I, that could be a detriment in the sense I, I'm a cut to the chase type person. Don't give me all the details. And I have to take a step back when I enter into the presence of God and talk with him because God's a very detailed person. Now he'll talk to you the way he can get things across to you. So I appreciate that about him. He knows that, that many times it's just like, let's cut to the chase. But he has to slow me down. And say, this is not about cutting to the chase. 
This is about sitting down with me and letting me explain to you how this works. And it's not about cutting three or four steps out. Uh, because we all know when you're assembling something and you cut three or four steps out, you're putting your life in danger. <laughs> or your child, if it's the, the bicycle that you're putting together for them. <laughs> uh, we don't want to cut any parts out. Amen? So come boldly. That's what we're talking about. Coming boldly. Amen? The Bible's clear. We need to come to Him. Not just the Bible. We need to come to Him, the writer of the Bible. He tells us, come boldly to Him, to the throne, to where He sits, to where He talks, to where the real person of the Holy Ghost, the real person of Jesus, the real person of God, the Godhead, and talk with them sit with them and let them share the truths that only they can share and expound on the written word and give us the intricate details of why things worked the way they worked and how things work. Amen. Because I think all of us would have us could say that the desires of our heart uh, two desires of our heart, I would say, would be to walk the life of Christ, meaning in our personal bodies and in our personal lives, to walk just like he did. That, that if sickness shows up at your door, it can't even attach itself to you. It just dies. Um, if lack of resources seem to be there, that the Spirit of God would just speak to us and take whatever... Uh, means we have and that we could be like Jesus with the feeding of the 5,000 and take what he had and just lift it up and ask God to bless it and it began to multiply and, and get away from trying to do things in our own strength you know go get a second job <laughs> work a bunch of overtime uh, you know switch jobs because they're not paying you enough uh, give him what you've got and let him multiply it give him what you've got and let him multiply it Give him your body and let him, let him keep it cleansed. The blood of Jesus cleansed. What did it cleanse? It cleansed sickness off of us. Amen. And it's still cleansing sickness off. Take a bath in the blood every day. <laughs> Amen. Let it cleanse the impurities of what this world's trying to put on you, off of you. And it'll stay in divine health. Amen. Glory to God. So we need to come to him. Amen? Amen. Well, let's go to him right now with our tithes and offerings.